five watts. But I think we should start. Uh, I don't want to delay any further. Thank you all for attending this webinar hosted by the SICE IT division. Uh, we are excited to hear from our guest speakers who will present on the construction of the Polyhali Dam, Western Access Road Utilizing Digital Technology. So, My name is Kubian Governor, the chair of the SICE IT division. Without taking much of your time, I want to provide a concise intro to our division and what we aim to accomplish. Our vision is to promote the science and the art of the use of electronic computers in the field of civil engineering. Uh, simply put, uh, we aim to educate our members to the provision of training and the dissemination of information relating to electronic computational procedures and associated technology by hosting formal and informal meetings, symposia and webinars involving these subjects. We aim to accomplish this through um, partnerships with industry leaders in, relate, in related technologies and through constant two-way communication with our members. Our focus is to add value to educating our industry on new technologies from both a hardware and a software uh, perspective. We want to pr provide exposure to new technologies that may become useful to the civil engineer, particularly as the traditional boundaries between engineering disciplines are becoming increasingly fluid, dynamic, robust, and incorporative. We believe we can achieve this by taking cognizance of the need of our members and providing you with support to tackle and challenge, uh, to tackle the challenges you face um, within the industry by providing relevant content on the latest technological advancements uh, in the sector. Uh, we want to attract more professionals as well into the industry, particularly by encouraging professionals, both young and older, to, to become more aware of new technology, technologies excuse me, <coughs> and the extraordinary potential technology unlocks when correctly applied in the civil engineering industry. Uh, we have recently rebranded the IT division um, and we have a fresh new look. Aside from our website, our social media platforms are informative and a sub to them would be appreciated, as well as a great way to keep yourself updated on new te technological developments. Uh, also, should you have any relevant contents, uh, articles, projects or research that could showcase the use of technology in the civil engineering industry, we encourage you to forward your submissions for vetting and publication to our social media platforms. Um, our social uh, media manager will gladly work with you to refine your work and assist you in sharing your knowledge and be, being acknowledged as well for the contribution you are making. Um, we have a group of diverse, energetic, dedicated members who um, gracefully volunteer the time on the SICE IT Division Committee. Um, aside from me, these are Philip Boyens, he's our Vice Chair. Um, there's Anisha Fille, our past Vice Chair. There's Peter Webb, our Treasurer. Debbie Bessling, our Admin Support. Wood, Bill Jones, our past Chairperson. Jerry Lekalakala, our Social Media Manager. Masoa Tsoa, uh, our Committee Member, and Anton van Dijk. Um, Gandhi once said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And we have a great team that uh, ha has volunteered their time and are committed and driven to make a difference in our industry. We aim to provide a platform to introduce and discuss new technologies and that, that can be used by the civil engineer to remain relevant considering the latest technological advances in our industry. We also aim to provide the support and opportunities for you to uh, move to be more involved uh, or con to contribute towards the betterment of our industry. So just a little house general housekeeping. Our pro this is our program um, and, and our general protocol for the webinar as, as shown. Kindly forward your questions during the presentation using the Q&A box and not the chat function. Um, the Q&A session will be moderated by our Peter Webb and as well as the event closure. Uh, the SICE IT division appreciates the presenters' efforts to share their knowledge, project, project experience, and lessons learned in the use of digital technology. 
And we appreciate our members and students that have taken the time to attend this event. We are confident that it will add value and be of benefit to you. I now hand over to our Peter Webb uh, to welcome and introduce the presenters. And over to you, Peter. I will just stop sharing my screen now so that you can take over, or, or would you prefer me to keep the screen up? Um, you can keep the screen up, that would be fine. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Kuban. Um, okay, my job, um, I'm Peter, Peter Webb. And uh, my job is to actually introduce uh, the presenters this afternoon. So first up, we have Karin van Heerden. Uh, Karin holds a degree in civil engineering from the University of Pretoria. She is a professional engineer registered with EXA and also a member of SICE. She is currently the assistant resident engineer on the Poly Holly Western Access Route in Lesotho, overseeing earthworks, bridge construction, and stormwater site designs. Her particular interest is in increasing productivity with computer-aided design tools. So next we have Jacques, that's Jacques Nordier. Jacques is a professional engineer registered with EXA and manager with more than 20 years experience also with a degree in civil engineering from the University of Pretoria. He is currently the director of the contract management and supervision business unit in Africa for AECOM. Previously, he was the resident engineer in the construction management and site supervision of several projects, including the Hauteng Freeway Improvement Project for Sunrail. As well as working in South Africa and Lesotho, he has also worked in Mozambique and Uganda. He has extensive experience in roads and stormwater drainage. And then we have Andre, Andre Schumann. Andre is the digital project delivery lead in Africa for ACOM. Andre is a civil engineering technologist with varied civil engineering and management experience, with work experience in the field of water articulation design and bulk earthworks, combined with a strong technical background in project delivery engineering systems. Currently, Andre is the BIM manager, civil infrastructure for AECOM. His responsibilities include developing and supporting the direction for leadership on BIM and supporting the digital project delivery team and BIM director. He has extensive experience in the use of 3D, 4D and 5D processes to support construction planning, logistics, estimating and coordination. So before we start, just remember the housekeeping. All questions go in the Q&A, not in the chat. Uh, if you put them in the chat, then we won't all be able to see them. So put them in the Q&A and we will handle the questions after the presentation. So we'll now hand over to Jacques and the team who will take us through the webinar titled Construction of Poly Harley Dam Western Access Road utilizing digital technology, which I'm sure will provide us all with a really good insight into the use of digital technology in civil engineering. So over to you, Jacques. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for those kind words. And thank you, Kevin, and for SICE IT division to, uh, to uh, afford us this opportunity just to share uh, our journey as far as digital technology and our implementation is concerned. So um, uh, you've been introduced to the team, uh, but perhaps just to uh, put a little bit of context to it. So Andre was really the, the brainchild and the initiator of uh, this particular uh, program and what we're going to share with you guys. And of course, uh, Karin has been instrumental in implementing it on site. She's one of our designers and currently on site, and uh, she's played a, a major role in making this a reality as well. So guys, we're just going to take you through this presentation and our journey on the hand of uh, a couple of points that you can see there on the screen. As far as the general overview is concerned, 
Um, I'll start with the uh, road to here and, and why the change. And then I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the current project uh, and the first project uh, on which we've implemented uh, these technologies. I'm going to hand over to, to Andre and between Andre and Karin, they will tell you guys about the implications of changing and also the specific implementation on site and some of the, the challenges perhaps that we've seen. And then we'll conclude with uh, some uh, potential improvements and some questions that you guys may have. So road to here and why the change? I must say this picture probably tells it all in my mind. Um, now we've been fortunate in the sense that on the design side, uh, we've made some uh, huge advances, uh, but on construction side, we, we felt like we were drowning a little bit in paperwork. Um, now we've been doing things pretty consistently and uh, pretty effectively for a long time. But uh, we, we did realize that we need to make a couple of changes. Now, filing, uh, as you all know, I mean, these days, construction supervision is, uh, is not only construction supervision. It's an administratively intensive exercise. And uh, the filing, the retrieving, the reviewing of documents um, and storage and, and digitizing of, of documents on site poses a huge challenge. And, and that also created the first tick box for us is to find a solution to deal with some of these issues. Oversight from head office, um, you know, just to, to be able to visit the site from a contract administration perspective uh, is sometimes challenging time, distances, but um, also in terms of interacting with designers if, if things happen and, and we do get challenges on site is to be able to, to engage with them in an easy manner. And uh, that created another tick box for us to try and resolve how we're going to do this, how we're going to bring these worlds together. So ultimately, um, we, we found ourselves pretty much best described in the words of Stuart Brandt, a well-known American writer, where he said, once a new technology rolls over you, if you are not part of the roller, you're part of the road. And we, we just realized that we need to make that step. We need to make that step uh, to, towards technology. Otherwise, we're going to exactly like that, just end up part of the road and being left behind. So let me tell you about the project that we decided uh, to use and to implement some of these technologies on. Now, I must start off by saying that this is probably the worst and the best project to start it off on. Worse in the sense that you would have liked to identify a project just around the corner and easy accessible so that we can implement these technologies. But unfortunately, at the time when we decided it's now or never, this was the first project that presented itself. and. Um, we had to, we, we just had to go for it. So this project is, as far as all the other tick boxes are concerned, are pretty much up there, uh, but it's also fairly remote. Uh, it is in the middle of uh, the Maluti Mountains, part of the Drakensberg uh, mountain range. And um, it's also an extremely unique opportunity in the South African context to get a Greenfields road of 54 kilometers is, is pretty, pretty rare. Uh, up in Africa, we sometimes more privileged, but um, to have one on our doorstep basically uh, was, was really a privilege. Um, the whole emphasis and the whole idea of the road itself is if you can see on the top part of the slide, the map, uh, the, the Polihadi Dam that uh, is about to be constructed in a while and uh, to create the infrastructure and part of that is the access road to it is what we are fortunate to be involved with. Now, the, the reason for that 54 kilometer road is not only um, to help with uh, social and economic upliftment of the area, but it was really initiated uh, out of the need to bring in a tunnel boarding machine. And um, the other passes currently that can be used to to access the Porihari site is the Sani Pass and Muting, but just way too steep and uh, too many curves and too sharp turns to be able to navigate heavy equipment and uh, especially a tunnel boring machine. 
apart from constructing this particular road, uh, we were also privileged to get uh, 100 kilometers worth of uh, rehab job that connected the old or the, the uh, Katsi Dam, and that was the old access road uh, to the from the north uh, go, going down to Katsi, and you can just see it on the left hand side of the map um, depicted by the black line there. So as with any project, uh, this project was definitely not um, uh, spared from challenges, and that's probably why we are there. But the first challenge was definitely geology, and uh, blasting is pretty much one of our critical path items. We need to blast and uh, ultimately remove well in excess of a million cubic meters of uh, rock. And unfortunately, uh, in excavating in these areas and with steep slopes, as you can see at the bottom of the uh, slide, uh, we also experience some slips. Now, that's one of the opportunities that we now had is to engage our geotech and designers uh, to be able to give inputs into um, challenges like this. Um, the rock itself or the rock cuts, um, this road is pretty much uh, in cutting the whole time. We've got very little opportunity of fills. And so we're also creating a lot of um, uh, spoil and uh, to manage spoil sites is also a bit of a challenge. So the mountainous re region itself also creates a lot of challenges. Um, now, we uh, are constructing roads that's uh, approaching 15% in longitudinal slopes. And uh, it's, it's very mountainous, uh, mountainous, as you can imagine. But it also gives us the opportunity to, uh, to employ a, a lot of um, methods that we don't normally get the opportunity to do. In the top picture, you can see just the start of a terrateral wall, uh, one of many that we are constructing. Uh, huge gabion structures, uh, retaining walls uh, that is uh, required. And then out of the topography, uh, the steep slopes that we have and the flash uh, rainstorms uh, does create a lot of flash floods as well. So drainage structures is also one of those things that we get an opportunity to, to implement a lot of uh, various um, uh, methods. Uh, in the picture to the Right, you can see one of the bigger Armco structures uh, being assembled, but it's also one of those um, very valuable resources, topsoil, that get lost in, um, in these uh, rainstorms. So that's one of the challenges as well, to be able to contend with erosion, but also try and retain some of these um, uh, topsoil um, wastes that we do get. Inclement weather. You can imagine where we're constructing uh, the road uh, for a fair bit of the distance above snow line, above 2,700 meters, approaching 3,000 meters. Um, the cold weather is definitely a challenge, but it also presented a couple of unique opportunities. So uh, freeze thaw is one of those things that definitely had to be considered in doing uh, concrete designs, but uh, also our base course is specifically tailored for that. So it's almost a gap graded uh, base course to allow that if there is water ingress that it can freeze and, and thaw out without damaging the, um, the, the, the particular layers. So <clears throat> the cold itself, <clears throat> excuse me. So the cold itself not only create that opportunity obviously to um, to implement a couple of interesting designs, uh, but also it limits our operation in terms of uh, concrete pores, uh, asphalt. You can imagine we had the opportunity to visit site about a week ago again, and um, uh, nighttime temperatures was very close to minus six, minus seven constantly, and it warms up to a, a warm and, and fuzzy four degrees, five degrees. Um, but it can definitely get much colder. So in, in the really in the heart of the winter, it does limit our operational time as well. So uh, the site location itself presents a challenge as well as one of those tick boxes that we identified initially. So just to get across the border does have these challenges uh, in itself. 
So to be able to engage with site image, able to engage with uh, the challenges that we have without necessarily going through all these uh, challenges is, is definitely a benefit. And uh, we started this project and uh, I must admit, it was one of those benefits when COVID hit us, where for a long period, the, the team was pretty much isolated, where we could have cons uh, continued with construction there, but cross-border movement was very restricted. This also uh, afforded us a unique opportunity to be able to implement and utilize the technologies that we did, did implement. So I'm going to hand over to Andre to give us a bit of a background in terms of the technology itself and some of the uh, challenges on, on e site. Andre, over to you. Thank you, Jock, and uh, thanks everyone for, for allowing us to present this to you. Um, yeah, so on the, on the first slide, I'm just going to briefly touch on my role where I fit in and uh, where I'm responsible for digital transformation, um, more on the civil infrastructure side of the business. And um, yeah, so as, as you guys are familiar with digital transformation, that is the area that um, I, I would, would say all the companies should have uh, someone looking after that as, as it's a constant moving target. And um, it, because of the, the way technology changes in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, so, so we basically took the first approach to, to move away, like Jock mentioned earlier, from a paper-based um, system where uh, we're going into a more digital digital system. And um, I think, uh, yeah, this, uh, like Jack said, you, you have to be, if you look at that slide, are you gonna innovate or are you gonna extinct? Um, so you have to make that decision to, to move towards this, uh, even if it's, a, um, how can I say, exponential change in, in technology. Um, most of you will be familiar with that fourth industrial revolution. Um, that is, um, yeah, that topic, it comes up a lot these days, and um, that's basically where we are today. If we if we look back in history at the evolution of these um, industrial, uh, basically from the first to to the fourth, and then we can look at the first industrial revolution where that started in in Great Britain in the 1700s, and uh, that was the invention of the steam engine, and um, that basically led to new manufacturing processes and factories, and then um, looking at this at second revolution. That uh, was marked by basically mass production and uh, new industries um, basically um, were created like steel, oil and electricity. Um, together with that, the, the invention of the light bulb, the telephone and internal combustion engine for vehicles. And then moving to the third industrial revolution, um, that was the digital revolution, the personal computer and the internet. And I think just from there, um, where we are today, looking at the fourth industrial revolution, how, how quickly it's changing and it's getting more, how can I say, like I said, exponentially changing um, uh, going forward, uh, the, the artificial intelligence, internet of things, um, all of this is ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, even with our, body, our bodies with all these smart devices and sensors that you put on your wrist. Um, you, you've got these voice activation, facial recognition stuff. Um, so everything is, is just exponentially changing um, and merging. It's basically almost merging the physical with the digital. And also what you've seen in the biologi biological, what the doctors are doing with technology is just uh, crazy um, where, where we are already today. Um, so we have to find, looking at all of this, we have to find new ways of doing things. Otherwise you'll be left behind. Um, um, you, can, you can see there all the topics below there. Uh, it's a bit small, but uh, yeah, there's so much, but I think we need to identify areas where related to our industry, looking at 3D printing, connected devices, um, let's say the internet of things are gonna start to play a major role going forward with all the sensors. Um, so we, we need to look at how we, we can basically adapt our design standards and, and implement these new technologies and make, it, make our businesses basically more, more efficient going forward. Um, the internet of things um, is basically almost everyone connected everywhere and, and, and the, the amount of speed or the, the, how can I say, the improvement, just looking at your 5G networks and all of that in the last year, all of this makes it possible. I think if we were looking back a couple of years ago, uh, this wouldn't have been um, possible if uh, the internet speed. Um, just looking at what Elon Musk is doing with his Starlink satellite networks, where, where he's looking, he's aiming towards a, a, a global inter internet network um, where you've got 50 to 150 megabits anywhere in the world. And I think just by, look, by that, 
um, we're going to have a significant change in our industry. On the next slide, um, I'm, I just want to talk about uh, the approach that we took. Um, look, the most important thing, you, I think most of you have seen this, this slide as well. Uh, it's an old slide, but the process, technology, and people. Um, I would say the most important and success behind this implementation was the people. Uh, firstly, with Jock, who, who were willing to, to take that first step towards a digital implementation. And like you said, we, we made the, the decision and it's a, it's a, it was one of the bigger projects. It's not, your, not a, a small project, but we, we, we basically had a look at, if you look on the right as well, it's almost, you have to redefine your, your business strategy and, a, and it's a big cultural change. Um, uh, the company needs to be committed to a digital transformation and it's a journey. It's not like a one or two years and you'll be digitally transformed. It's an ongoing change. And uh, I think, like I said, with the change in technology, you, you'll constantly strive to, to improve your current way of doing. Um, it must be, it, for me, it's also very important that it's leadership driven uh, from the top down. And, and, and like I said, Jock, uh, we, we spend a lot of time and, and, and investing time into this and thinking it through, planning, sharing ideas, um, my, me coming more from a digital side and Jock coming from the uh, understanding all the processes that needs to happen. And, and teamwork is crucial to make a success in this. Um, and enabling the technology to improve your business collaboration and communication between all parties. Yeah, and uh, I would say that's, that's very important. And on the next slide, um, it's, it's the implementation. Um, also, looking at the process, we, we had predefined coming over the years with, in construction, we had policies and procedures in place, uh, Excel spreadsheets that used to be our check, uh, just an example, a checklist that we're doing to do, go, go and do physical inspections. And um, so, so we had to sit and, and, and identify uh, what, do, what can we, at, at this stage, looking at the platform, that, or the tools that we've got, the digital tools, and, and identifying areas that we can transform and make, digitize it, basically. So we had to, um, th that upfront time, we spend a lot of time configuring it and, and, communi and, and then communicate and training staff, uh, people like Karin, uh, I would say that's another very important, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, aspect of, of this implementation. Having key users on the, like Jock showed, it, we, we've got three different sites. So almost at each one of those sites, you have to have a person who's almost like a power user who understands the system. And, and looking at the graph on the right as well, you can, you can see also everyone probably have seen this graph, but um, looking at the effort and effect you put in at the start and, and the time and cost, and I must say, um, looking back in, in, in the success behind this as well, again, we, we've put up a lot of upfront time. And if you just look at number one there, that's ability to impact cost and functional capability. So the more effort you put in earlier, um, the less will the impact be on your time and cost at a later stage. Um, yeah, so we basically trained, trained the staff and then we started to use the system. We also piloted uh, just doing a test with a smaller group before we rolled it out and then gathered feedback again and see what worked. And, and even still today, we, we gather feedback and, and make some changes. So on the next slide, looking at the um, software and the hardware requirements, I'll, I'll first start with the software. So we had very specific needs. And like Jock mentioned, um, the site were quite remote. There was a limited reception uh, with the mountains and everything, and it's difficult working conditions. So, so we, because we had so many, uh, how can I say, um, residential engineers on site. So it, it's important that we equip all of these guys with mobile to, mobile solutions that, that they can walk around with on site and they can, they can basically easily capture information. And then uh, these days, everyone, almost all of us has got access to a smartphone, which makes it easier. So you don't have to go and, and, and buy additional hardware like iPads. We did invest in iPads as well. Um, but um, most, of, uh, most of the apps works on the smartphones, which makes it much easier um, uh, to, to, to implement a solution like this. Um, and then um, also then the geo-reference data, that was, that was a, um, due to the scale of this project. It's a, I, I think we've also got a buildings and places side and they look after more buildings and, 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 and the vertical infrastructure, but for us, in civil infrastructure, we, our, our project scale and spans over much larger areas. So for us, it's crucial to, to have a system that's got due reference data. Um, you need to see where exactly that, that was captured and so on. Um, also, because of limited internet on site, there's not 
no internet um, network infrastructure basically in the city. So especially on that remote site, there's no fiber lines and you don't have any, any internet. So we, we're basically using 3G, um, 3G internet and it's capped. So it's not uncapped internet. So, so that's why we were especially looking at drone data to process the data. We, we tested cloud solutions, but then uh, we do, did realize quickly that's eating, using a lot of data. So we had to find local, local solutions to process it on a laptop or, or a desktop. Um, we also um, spent some time creating support guides, support guides and training the staff. That's also crucial that, um, of course, there's a lot of new staff joining the teams on site. It's not always the same team. There's a couple of people, but once you train, we, we used to train the trainer approach. So as the people join the teams, um, they can quickly um, give them a, a support guide and there's a step-by-step -step manual that they can follow and, and, and quickly get up to speed. And even if you didn't use it for a while, you can always fall back and make sure. And we also shared that with a contractor. That was part of the solution that we wanted to make the contractor part of uh, the whole digital process. So we made a separate guide for him as well that they can use and, and, and make sure that they understand what to fill in on the iPads and which areas and so on. Um, so we spent up, the, as part of that project setup time was basically creating the checklist, uh, setting up location, inspection check templates that we use. And we, we added a lot of addi uh, additional properties. So the out of the box solution, um, how can I say didn't work for us. We had to find and even workarounds um, and, and stuff, how to, how to make this work for us. So that's why if you look at the above, the digital workflow required the use of various software systems. We couldn't just uh, standardize on one vendor. So we're stepping across various solutions and Karin will, will show you guys um, um, how it's being used on site when, when she presents. And on the next slide, looking at the hardware requirements. Um, so we, we had three site offices that we had to uh, set up. Um, and um, again, um, the initial, we initially planned to, because, because we have bigger amounts of data, we, we, if you look at, it's a bit unclear that, that diagram on the right, but you can see we we want, we bought some NAS NAS devices. That's a small storage device um, that you that you um, can store data on offline, and it's almost like a small hard drive that you that you can make use. And we were like you can see there, we were linking the internet, and then you've got your network, and then then you can link it back to the cloud. But as we say, as as the as as systems and like I say, the technology keeps on improving as well. So now we, we're still using the NAS devices, but uh, for our drain data and big, big chunks of data. And then we, we can now, even for our document management, if we look at the common data environment where all our data are stored and, and documentation and so on, we're working directly off the cloud and we can access our information. We've also helped a lot during, especially during COVID that we've got now got accessibility. People can sit anywhere and, and move, moved away from that server that we used to have on site and now we've got access to, to any information sitting in the cloud. Just looking at the, the, the hardware, or what can I say, the, the network requirements, you can look at the, currently there is, and Karin, you can also chip in or talk later about this, but the current data usage on our one site is 400 gig a month. Um, our line speech average download, you can see we're getting away, not, not adding a <laughs> very big, uh, uh, or fast download speeds, five megabytes a second and a megabytes a second and the upload is 15. Um, so if, if at Elon Musk's, uh, how can I say, Starlink goes, goes live, I think we're gonna benefit a lot. And again, then you can start to see these smart devices on, on site and so on. Um, yeah, so we also invested, like we say in the hardware, the NAS storage devices, iPads with robust covers because there's tough working conditions on site if you drop it. And then we also invested in the drones. Um, yeah, so going, Karin, and we'll show you guys now the live, uh, all the tools, how she implemented it on site, and give you guys an overview. Thanks, Karin. Thanks, Andre, and thanks everybody for joining us. So I'll be talking about the work on the ground, how we've actually implemented all these fancy ideas, and how, how it's going. So the first and the most exciting, uh, I'll first just give a summary of the technologies we implemented. First is drone photography, which I feel is the most exciting one of the technologies. We use this for reporting with pretty pictures, and we also use this to create 3D models that can be used to look at designs or inform new designs or alter existing things if problems are picked up. The next thing, um, the next technology is ArcGIS. We use this for reporting 
activities on site in the pro in the form of daily diaries or even in just random photo logging and um, updating of activities happening on site. So these two items is basically for logging information and informing design changes or new designs that is required on site. The next um, technology is BIM 360. We use this for inspection requests. So as I can imagine, it was previously done in an inspection book where you have to write your inspection request that you want to do. This now gets logged by the contractor on BIM 360 and it reaches us um, the morning of, of the morning. <laughs> Um, and then we can see during the day what inspections is required from us. This information, like Andre mentioned, there's a lot of special fields we also added to this, this platform. And this helps us to um, inform as builds and lab results and all those type of things. So that's mainly used for inspections. Then lastly, we use Power BI uh, just to summarize the information on BIM 360. So, as I go through the items, you'll see the BIM360 platform is quite extensive. There's a lot of information there, and that's not always very consumable. So we've we used Power BI just to create a dashboard of the BIM360 information, and that easily allows people that wants insight on the on the progress or on the general information on the project to to get a dashboard and see a summary of what's going on. So that's basically just used for tracking. So if we start with drone photography, um, maybe I'll just mention that although in South Africa you need a license to fly a drone in the city, they haven't um, passed that legislation yet. So if you have a drone, you can fly it, but you just need to notify a, a council in, in Masiru about the times you're going to fly it, but they're just aware of it. But you don't need to go through the strenuous requirements that's applicable in South Africa. So the first thing we use the drone for is just the progress pictures. This is one of the bridges, Makwaba Bridge. So there's a lot of apps you can use on your phone to, to fly the drone. The specific one I've used is supposed to save the location in space that it's taking the picture from, allowing you to get a picture from the same angle every time to allow you to see the progress um, develop. So yeah, that's the first the first thing we use the drones for is just to give progress pictures and overview of the site. The next thing we use the drone for is to um, basically survey items on site. So I'm quickly going to run through the process that we do when we survey it. So there's also various apps you can use to take the survey pictures. It just has to be taken in a grid from um, 90 degrees down. Um, so this this App specifically is Pix4D that I'm using. So I would go to site, I will fly the drone in the grid. As you can see, this is quite a short process. It's 12 minutes as shown here at the bottom. I will then come back to the office and download all these drone pictures on our NAS device uh, as it's quite big pictures. We don't want that to sync to the cloud and use up all our data. This then gets processed. The program we're using is Context Capture from Bentley. Uh, but and the main advantage of this program is it can work offline. It doesn't have to sync to the cloud as some of the other processing programs uh, requires. After it's processed, you can use it for several things. Uh, one of them is aerial imagery. You can generate 3D models. Uh, this is from Bentley Complex Capture Viewer. You can generate 3D models. And you can also extract a surface from this data. So the surface is not... It, there's various degrees of accuracy, um, but we've tried, we wanted to use the surface data to look at as builds or final survey of the road. And we found that it's not that accurate, but big, big um, surfaces like, for instance, spoil sites or quarries or slips that has a big surface area, we found that that's, that's a good enough representation of the surface for, for the estimates we need. So example of one of the drone footage areas that I've taken is this very big cutting that we put that on, on PUR. And as you can see, that cut face looks a bit um, not that great. So this was one of the things we wanted our geotex in the office to look at. And as I couldn't come to site immediately due to all the challenges, I flew this area with the drone. And then I've created the 3D model of it. So here you can see the context capture viewer of that area. 
there's um, one of the things that the geotech specifically like to do is to turn off the imagery and then they can see the, the, the material properties or the rock formations more clearly without the distraction of color. Um, luckily, this, or this models can also, is quite decent on scale. So you can take measurements, you can take areas um, to get an idea of what, what is represented to you, if, if that helps to inform the decision. The more you can, when you fly a drone, you can have ground control points, which we basically printed A1 papers with a big X on it, and we put it on places on the ground. And then when you, you fly the drone, it takes pictures of that. And if you know the coordinates of that Xs, you can make your model more accurate. If you don't have it, it doesn't make that much of a difference. You'll just see some distortion, um, especially if you take a very long, slender picture. You'll see some distortion at the ends, which can be corrected with some ground control points. My personal favorite of using the drone photography is to put it on Civil 3D or on, on our design software. And you can easily see, over, or you can easily overlay the design and see where there might be problems or where there might be shortages. For instance, this cutting, we can see that on the left-hand side, the contractor actually undercut or they had a width problem and they needed to extend this cutting. Then the next uh, technology I'll be talking about is ArcGIS. So as Andre mentioned, one of the advantages of this is to have geolocation information. So we use two apps, the one is Collector and the other one is Survey123. So Collector is basically just taking random photos of progress on site. So if it, it doesn't have to be inspection request, the contractor or the foreman doesn't have to specifically call you out, you just use it to take some progress pictures. Survey123 is replacing what they previously um, used daily diaries for, basically logging the weather and the plant used on site. And this, both these things can often be used to support claims or any, anything that the contractor would say they've got standing time or they asked for standing time because this and this and this, and then you've got a due location date stamped photo of or proof of what activity is happening on site, thanks to these apps. So I did a little screen recording of how I use ArcGIS. So as you can see, we've loaded the roads in the line on the app. Um, it dual locates where I am with my cell phone. And then if I zoom in, it shows me the changes. Um, I can then just take a photo from my phone. And then I like putting the changes in the um, description. So this is a completed progress. And this is um, was a sub base layer that they processed. So. I'll stop with the change, which I can see on the on the phone due to the geo referencing, and I'll add the description. Um, once I'm finished with this, I can then submit it. Uh, this needs a internet connection, but it gets saved on your phone until you are within internet. So there, you can see I've got eight local edits. Once I'm at on. Once I'm at the office, I'll sync it and it will be uploaded to the cloud. The next app is the ArcGIS Survey123 app. So it's the same principle. It also gets a geolocation from your phone. You mention what activity you're busy um, observing and a description. Once again, I like adding the changes just to make it clear. It also sometimes happens that your geolocation, there's a glitch in it and it will shoot to a um, a signal tower or something like that. And then if you have a change in the description, then it's a lot easier to find. So the next we'll, we'll say what, what it is. It's called, it's windy. There's no um, areas of concern and the plant on site is a grader and a grid roller. There's no visitor and then we can also submit it. And this will, when it's connected to Wi-Fi, also be submitted to the cloud. So. This information that you log on your phone is then available on the desktop as well. And this can be filtered with various means. So first way of filtering it is just by zooming in and out to the location you want. I'm currently zooming in at Makwaba Bridge. As you can see, it's there saying filter by map extent. So it filters out only the items that's within this region. Um, then I can also sort it by date created, by comment by type if it's a structure of works and anything like that 
um, you can s filter it more specifically. So I can say I want to just see things that was done up to the end of January, and then it will filter out all the items that is specific to that or that was captured in that time frame. If I want to select a specific item, I just click on the little square at the, at the left hand side and it will open that item. I can look at the photo that I've taken and continue like that. There's various ways to filter um, this information. Okay, so I'm just showing a few other pictures. One of the other ways to filter it is by name. So if I put in my own name and apply, it will only show the pictures that I've taken. And then the, the same thing is applied to the daily diaries of the survey one, two, three. You can also filter it by map extent, or for instance, if you want to know if it rained on a specific day, you take away the map extent filter and you can just filter it by day and see all the information that was logged on that day. Um, so yeah, well, that's basically the web dashboard for these for these two tools that we've been using. The next item, um, the next technology that I would like to discuss is BIM 360. So um, as Andre mentioned, we needed to prepare quite a bit of additional fields or custom fields um, that is not in the out of the box BIM 360. Sorry, this is not, this is BIM 360 field. Um, people joining from the structures department would know BIM 360 as something totally different. So yeah, BIM 360 field is specifically what we use on site to log inspections. So some of the custom, custom fields that we added to our BIM 360 is listed here, chain H2 from layer thickness, concrete, and all those things. Um, this will then help to inform the asphalt information. Then some of the things, some of the other custom fields was related to approvals. So me as the inspector would approve something on site, but other some items just doesn't just need a visual approval. It also needs a lab a lab test result or a survey information, and then finally the resident engineer to approve it. So all these fields were also added um, as from the experience that Jock and them had with previous sites. Then the other um, setup or other item thing that needed to be customized in the setup was the location. So I'm just going to use structures as an example, but this also applies to roads and stormwater and all these things. So we've got a location for structure structures and in that location we've got three bridges and um, what per bridge we've got a lot of elements and per element we then have the blinding the base and each lift for this for a pier specifically um, is shown here and then for a specific element we'll then have a pre pour inspection which typically is reinforcing or survey information shutters is clean all those things then we've got a pour, which is the actual concrete pour, and then a post pour, which is looking inspecting the concrete for defects or anything in that line. So uh, another nice feature of the MP60 field is all the inspections that's logged, you can view for the day. So for instance, you can see we've been quite busy on Thursday and um, on today. <laughs> and and yeah, this is then the idea is you can plan your day and see where there's stuff need, that needs to happen on the same time and everybody knows what's expected of them. So I'm quickly gonna show you a typical inspection. So this is a, the iPad screen. Um, this is how the inspections look when we get it in the morning uh, or when it's synced to the cloud. I can then filter it by um, location. So we're just gonna look at structures. I think if you didn't miss the first filter, the first filter was just filtered by day. So I filtered it for today only. Um, the structure inspection is uh, what I want to do is the visual inspection for the rebar. Um, you can add attachments. So um, the, if you access the camera through the iPad, you can take some pictures. I just I like just taking a general picture of the works, showing everybody's wearing the COVID masks. And then you can also add some additional text under activity, uh, which I didn't do. And then the, another item that we've was part of the, the work, upfront work, is adding a lot of checklists. So here we've got many checklists that's filtered for structures, and I'm gonna use the reinforcing one. So all these questions comes from the archive of all the previous projects. 
and it's now on our system. So I look at the question, I can say past, fail, or not applicable. I can um, add comments to the inspection question uh, on tolerance. I can add it, I can raise an issue on a specific item, and I can add a picture. So um, it's expected to complete this checklist for, or a relevant checklist for every um, inspection we do. Uh, so, yeah, a lot, uh, even though we're using iPad, obviously a lot of the inspection items are still normal as normal inspections. We're still measuring the steel, checking it off on the bending sigil. It's just the way we capture it that changes. Um, then lastly, when I finish with the inspection. So those are the key people. I'm just a spectator in the discussion, but obviously from a risk management point of view, I, I Sorry. Um, yeah, please just hold your questions and comments to the end and then and then we'll answer them. Okay, at the end of inspection, we can um, we'll approve the uh, me as the inspector inspector will approve um, the inspection and then I'll put in my initials and then that will get sent to the cloud for the final in, the engineer to finally approve the specific inspection. Then this will get synced to the cloud as well. So that specific inspection request number that I've showed will also appear on the web interface. All the information that was previously, um, that I previously showed will also be here. And the checklist is also available to see if there's any comments or how the, what exactly the inspection contained and what the inspector noted. Um, here you can see the inspector approved and all those things. One of the um, handy things about this web interface is also the history. So everything that happens on the specific inspection request is cataloged here. So if for some reason someone changed the approved to rejected or anything in that line, the um, this will all be captured here so you can see exactly what happened at what time and and who have done that and the web the web interface can also be filtered in various ways as you can see it's quite extensive amount of information you can filter it according to drainage or structures or earthworks and then you can also filter it according to location so that location that i mentioned previously Structures, Makawa, it will only show the relevant um, inspection requests based on that. Um, Boundary 60 field also has an automatic reporting function that you can, at every end of week, you can see some, some of the information that's reported. Um, but we found that we need a, a, another or another system that sources it, sorts it exactly the way we want to display, um, display it. So, that, that specific technology we used is Power BI. So Power BI is basically building dashboards. The way we're currently using it is, um, is by exporting the 360 information to CSV file that gets um, emailed to me every morning and I save it on the network and that gets imported into Power BI desktop that syncs to Power BI web and then is available to everybody to view on their computer, on a team site, in various ways. So I'm also quickly just going to run through how that works. So Autodesk or BIM 360 field sends me the task list automatically every morning. I save it in a specified or in a predefined area that is then linked to the Power BI dashboard. So if I refresh the data from the Power BI dashboard, it will update the information. This gets then synced to the Power BI um, web and the Power BI web information is then, can then be seen either on the web itself um, or the way we, so this is the web itself. So you can see this is quite old. And then if I sync it, it will update to the latest information. Uh, the way I like seeing this information is on our team site, so we can share it on Teams as well on a, a Teams 
that we know. So here's our PR East team and the Power BI dashboard can be embedded in there. So the Power BI dashboard is also interactive. So if you want to filter it according to date and all those things, you can do that. So the slider allows you to select the date you want to look at and it automatically updates all the, all the graphs to only show the information for that specific date. For instance, uh, what I also like is the item scheduled per day. So you can see on a specific date, there was 11 requests scheduled. On this specific day in, in December, there was a rejected item. And if I select that, you see it highlights here on the NCR graph at the top. You can see the ID number, the description, and the NCR number. So that can easily then be tracked back to the um, non-conformance that was issued to the contractor. You can also select it by year. So if I select 2019, you'll see it only filters out the items that was done in 2019. And um, the activity type over distance here at the bottom, you can see they mainly did OFWORKS in 2019. And the work fronts is also quite visible. And that then concludes the technologies that we've implemented. Um, the room for improvement is I'm going to hand back to Jock again, as he will then discuss the things that we think might be important going forward. Thank you, Colleen. Um, guys, as you can see, where we found ourselves at the moment on this journey is probably best described by the famous words of Neil Armstrong, who said, one small step in terms of technology, but one giant leap in terms of mindset. So we acknowledge that we still have a long, long way to go. And pretty much the sky is the limit, but our mindset has changed. And, and if that's the only thing that we can leave you guys with and encourage you, those who haven't taken that step yet is to, to start to do it. So for ourselves, we've set a couple of targets in terms of what next uh, we need to improve on. And it's, um, it's already evident, you know, um, Kalina has been on site now for a while, um, but uh, she already refers to, uh, she heard things were done this way and that way. So already uh, things are pretty, getting pretty ingrained in terms of the new way of doing things. Um, the old request of approval books and uh, 600 files behind the resident engineer's desk is, is something that we would need to get away from. So for ourselves, linking these platforms uh, to payments itself, uh, payment items, that would be a huge advantage. Um, integrating it more in terms of laboratory and survey results to have that as interactive uh, is definitely something that, that would be hugely uh, beneficial. Uh, we are using it already in terms of client progress, but um, the intention, and it's already set up to give clients um, perhaps limited access, but that would be hugely beneficial to, to clients to be able to sit in their uh, offices and to be able to interrogate uh, just progress um, on a level that is, um, is good for their uh, consumption. But th that would be so good to to get the, the, the employers or the clients involved as well. And then, of course, streamlining the outputs in terms of as builds is something that we're also working uh, on at the moment. So that next step is, is really as, as wide as we want to make it. Um, but the one thing that, that we found that's working for us is to take those small steps um, and to continue with taking small steps. And hopefully, uh, we'll always stay part of the roller. So, Kevin and Peter, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to share this journey with you guys. And um, uh, over to, to you guys, if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much indeed for a truly outstanding presentation, um, which definitely shows how digital technology can be used to uh, facilitate advances in, in civil engineering. <clears throat> I see we've um, generated quite a few uh, questions. So 
Um, we've got uh, time to hopefully go get through as much as we can. Um, so let's just have a look here and see what we've got. The first question is from Charles. Where is the blasted going? Layer works or side spoil? So I'm not sure who would like to answer that. Well, I can go for that. We definitely hope for a big black hole, uh, but unfortunately not. So uh, in terms of um, material being blasted, uh, we, we do use um, in limited fills that we have, probably about 20% of the material that we excavate, uh, we try and use as far as we can uh, material, even if we have to put it through a single stage crusher for, for layer works. Um, but unfortunately, the majority of it does end up in spoil, but definitely not side spoil. That was one of the, the huge issues in the phase one on the Katsi project where uh, side spoil was, was pretty much in the order of the day, where now we're trying to get away from it. So there's designated spoil areas to take it to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is from Philip. How did you resolve the slope failure stroke slip? I think you showed in one of your slides there. I yes. Uh, oh yeah, Karim. Okay, so our geotechnical engineers came to analyze it and they proposed a Gabian wall towards the toe of the slip um, that would weigh, weigh it down and some other drainage uh, measures. This we then sent to the contractor and for their comments. And yeah, it hasn't been implemented yet, but we do have a solution. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> next question from Philip. How did the cold weather affect the grading of the material? Did the cold weather freeze the layer works? Well, perhaps from my side, um, in terms of cold weather, um, the, the only change that we've made, uh, uh, well, apart from the, the, the mixed designs, uh, concrete and, and even the asphalt um, is a couple of things that we, there are a couple of things that were implemented to obviously cater for the cold weather. Uh, but the three is four, uh, four in, in terms of the layer works itself, it's obviously the, the biggest uh, thing is as per usual is get water away, but uh, we did, find that on the old Katsi road, especially above snow line in the winter, that, uh, that if there is water ingress is that it, um, it, it tends to, to, to freeze in the layer and then it pops the layer. So the, the, the biggest design uh, uh, change there is to, to almost have a gap graded um, 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 design or grading. Um, so that if there is water ingress, that there is space for water to be able to, to expand um, in, in these layers. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is from Shepo. What are the lessons learned and recommendations drawn from the PWAR to similar projects in terms of employing digital technology? So what are the lessons learned and recommendations drawn from, from this project to similar projects in terms of employing digital technology? Quite a long question. Well, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure everyone would be able to add something there, but uh, yes. I'm, I'm talking now more from the perspective of, um, from a head office oversight is that I was a very worried about the, the internet speeds. Uh, so I want to encourage you, don't shy away from that. Uh, I think we, we've proven that uh, very low internet speeds can still support uh, digital technology like this. Um, small steps, uh, that's really, if, if you want to go for the grand um, implementation, you can probably do it, um, but it does take a culture change. It does take um, a lot of upfront work to be able to implement it. And, and my word of encouragement is rather take smaller steps, uh, investigate something, implement it thoroughly, and, um, and, and take it in, in that manner. Uh, Andre, Karin, I'm, I'm sure you guys got uh, something to add as well. Yes, no. just, sorry, yeah, Karin. You, you go, Andre. Okay, no, okay. I, I don't have anything extra to add. Okay, no joke. Yeah, so I think also now going forward, it, the, the, the solution that we implemented here is basically rolled out in all our construction projects. And uh, yeah, we did, um, we did find that the nice thing about this is we can 
all, all the customization that we spent up front for, for this project is, can just be used and, and the, the effort to implement, uh, uh, the, how can I say, the, the, a new project and set it up is not that that much uh, as what it take before. And uh, we've already, it helped us a lot, like I mentioned, the, the support guys have, uh, guides and everything that's already been created. So for someone new to, to adopt this system is quite easy. And um, yeah, so I must say there wasn't that much that went wrong <laughs> to, to say lessons learned. Uh, it, it all, I think it was also related to the amount of time that we spent up front planning this properly so um but yeah uh, going forward it's 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 quite easy to set up and i just uh, allowed time for most of the people don't uh, allow this time to do set it up so the lessons is just to spend some time up front with the different teams and explain it to them thanks peter thanks andre <clears throat> okay next question from fefe how long did it take to generate the 3D model using drones? I can answer that question. So it depends on the size of the model you want to generate, but it's actually not that long. Uh, smaller models can take up to half an hour to go through the whole process. And then bigger, bigger models can go to two hours and maybe three hours. The one thing is it uses quite a lot of RAM on your computer. So you should let it run overnight because you won't be able to do much else. Okay, thank you for Karine. Uh, next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what is the name of the app you use to capture the images? Are the pics taken from a satellite or you use the drone? So I can answer this one as well. We use the drone. So um, we've got a small um, drone. I don't know, Andre must just say what the name is. Uh, but it's all by, there's various apps you can use and the one is better than the other. It all does the same. The, a function. So the one I've been using to take um, aerial type photos is Pix4D. Um, and the one I've been using to take an angled photo from the same location is a lychee. But I know some of my um, colleagues also use drone deploy. But like I said, it's there's a variation of, of apps and, and they all perform the same function. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, from Williams. Thank you for a great presentation. Do you have an intranet portal for communicating and exchanging engineering data and design information between engineering and technical staff on site? Uh, Jock, I don't know if you might want to answer this. We don't have, so we communicate in traditional manner. So we do have a, a cloud storage of our fo folders and files that's on OneDrive slash SharePoint. So people in the office can access the same information that, that we have on site. I don't know if that is, is the question. Yes, you know, I can just... If I can also add, yeah. So again, uh, we, we started off with uh, SharePoint and, and, and exchanging information there. And also uh, there's another common data environment we that we're starting to look at as it's developed it is, is project wise but we're currently we mainly using SharePoint to 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 exchange information okay great thanks Andre uh, question here from Devon <clears throat> awesome to see how do you manage licensing of all these different software do you assign to individuals or is there a corporate license for the entire organization Yes, Peter, if I can answer, yeah, so uh, yes. with couple agreements with the different vendors, so that makes it quite nice that we can pick and choose, <laughs> so it helps a lot. So, yeah, that's that's how we deal with the licensing. Okay, so you're on a corporate sort of license worldwide. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, from, um, apologies if I pronounce the name wrong, is it Hyla? Uh, can the same software be used for more complex structures? For example, the Polyharley Dam inlet and outlet structures. Now, if I can also answer, and yeah, Jack and Karin, you're more than welcome to chip in as well. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, like I said, the, the amount of planning up front and what, how you want to implement the system that that will determine the outcome. So I think uh, just sitting down and with the different teams um, at, at early stages and, and plan it properly, and it can be used. I would say in any any structure. Or, <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it will be successful, yes. Thanks, Peter. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Alex, and the questions are pouring in here. 
is this system compatible with the SANREL requirements? Well, <laughs> Alex, uh, uh, I'm, anything can be done. Um, uh, I think um, we, we shied away from major uh, software development uh, necessarily uh, for the first steps that we've implemented. But uh, from what I've seen, and Andre would be able to, to also comment on it, is that um, ultimately the, the feed into a typical Sunrel ITER system is um, I, I, can't, I can't see that, uh, that it can't be done. Uh, we haven't attempted any, any of that, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure it can. Yeah, okay, Peter, I, just add, uh, I think, uh, yes. yeah, we just need to have those conversations. And I think that's where uh, us as an industry also needs to go. We need to, to make a workshop and, and plan. And, and even like Jock said, don't try to do everything at once, but we take small steps and see how we can, can integrate the local steps into a system like this or different systems. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Peter. Um, to do with inspection. So how are inspection findings, i.e. defects, et cetera, conveyed to the person who is responsible to repair the defect or the shortcoming? Uh, Peter, um, the, the setup of the system is, is it can accommodate um, exactly that. And, and our systems do run like that. Some contractors, however, are more proactive than others. We had the privilege now to implement it over a, a couple of projects. And um, what happens if you do note any finding um, that in the system, if a particular person on the contractor side, whoever is responsible for the repairs are linked into the system, that person will be notified immediately uh, when a notification is, is lodged. A, the person will receive the photographs, the comments, the, the geolocation, um, Whatever we ultimately build into the system is available immediately. The, any external party can access the, 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 the platforms and would be able to interrogate the information uh, uh, in more detail. Um, and they would be able to react on it long before we've issued an NCR or even um, issued a site instruction to do anything about it. So it all depends how much the contractors do buy in. Some do, and, and, it, and it works great for them as well. Others um, only use it as uh, the, the interaction with us uh, as the consultant to, to log inspections and ultimately uh, through that platform to drive the laboratory requests. But um, it, it is set up in such a way that uh, for the proactive contractor, they would take, uh, they, can, they can definitely reap benefits from it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> there's a question here from uh, Peter. Um, who paid for the development of the system? So I assume that means, was it part of the contract or was it something that you, know, you developed? I suppose that means. Well, unfortunately, uh, we developed it. Um, <laughs> so uh, we would have loved for the employers to be on board, but, uh, but ultimately it's an investment uh, internally um, to, to assist us, but, but we did. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here. <clears throat> have you been from from uh, Hill? Have you been able to determine the cost saving or efficiencies of using digital tech versus traditional? I must say we haven't attempted to do an exercise like that. Uh, Andre, maybe you can comment on it. But um, just the the interaction with design. Uh, if we take uh, some slips that we have, uh, slope stabilities. Um, issues that we had with uh, unforeseen um, in terms of founding conditions, just that interaction and to be able to give more detail, cut down on that interaction and the need to get people unnecessarily to site um, is, is a huge benefit. Um, I'm, I'm talking from the perspective of engaging with site teams from head office to be able to engage on payment certificates without even sitting near someone and to be collaborating on a piece of um, document that's open between us um, is, is usually beneficial. But uh, Andre, I don't know if we ever attempted a, a, a real numbers exercise on it. No, Jock, and I think that's maybe a good, uh, we must maybe do, <laughs> take an attempt and see 
uh, what what was the outcome the return on investment or whatever so i think that would be good too but we haven't really sat down and, and calculated it no okay thank you uh next question from uh citizen Bizo. how do you integrate your data when your various software such as between autodesk and bentley for example so how do you integrate how did you integrate data when you're using various software such so, as uh, i think karin can also also yeah. uh, but uh, it's a bit trial and error so we we figure it out so it's, it's uh, sometimes you you try different formats and you see what what works and what doesn't work so uh, myself and karin also spend a lot of time if we especially with the drone data as well and getting it into the different platforms and we look at we we basically see what works best and, and look at different ways till we find the almost like the sweet spot. Karin, I don't know if you also want to add something. No, maybe just uh, currently we're using it for different purposes. So um, Bentley, we don't use it for the design. We use it to process the drone images and then just pull that imagery into Autodesk. So as we're using it for different purposes, the, the link between them is a one-off thing. It's not like we're trying to have a live link between Bentley software and Autodesk software. So yeah, maybe that, that helps. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> Next question from Peter. Did you find there was perhaps some data overload which would make it difficult to generate information that was needed for adjudicating contractor claims? Maybe, um, Doc, you can talk about the contracting claims, but the data overload, yes. Um, the contractor at the start, they wouldn't, the, the amount of requests were sometimes difficult to to streamline so they would put in a request for every single thing and then you'll end up with 50 requests in your in your to-do list but it's basically could have been reduced to 10 so there's definitely some a learning curve or some streamlining required that that there's sensible information that it's not just a lot of a lot of data being generated that's not usable at the end so so we're definitely getting overloaded at some at the beginning and um, but that was streamlined out and it's it's more workable now so um i don't know jock if you want to mention something about no um i don't get the link necessarily so i don't understand the question in terms of the data overload and ultimately adjudicating the contractor's claim but the benefit in looking at the contractor's claims is is definitely um, in in the sense that the databases can be interrogated so on photographs, on inspections, on daily diaries, um, it becomes very easy to just uh, zoom in, literally just zoom in on the area um, that is um, uh, under question and to filter by date, uh, you would be able to pinpoint without slogging through a lot of photographs and daily diaries and um, unnecessary information to be able to pinpoint um, various uh, work activities. And, and it does, add value uh, to that uh, in, in a significant way. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question from uh, Hela. There is a significant amount of data being captured daily. How easily can trends be picked up, i.e. on concrete pores, ensuring that the concrete does not freeze? Are thermocouples being installed for the purpose of monitoring on large pores on the piers? Okay, so on, on that side, in terms of the um, uh, trends, again, with the data being available to interrogate that data um, is, is pretty easy. So it depends what one would want um, and to streamline it to a specific operation is quite easy. So if, if the focus would be on, um, on concrete pores and, and in terms of temperatures and ultimately generating even more data, um, it would be able to, one would be easily able to, to extract that data and to run any sort of um, trend or investigation that one would want. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I would say with, with data available, uh, the sky is the limits. You can, you can, you can mold it and, and interrogate it and apply it as, as you see fit. As far as, as further technologies like thermocouples are, couplers are concerned, um, at the moment we're still doing fairly uh, small pores, 
um, our structures are not not that large. It's not like uh, what is ultimately envisaged on some of the other uh, components of the Porihari Dam. Um, but um, so we're not using uh, that technology. Uh, we are looking at potentially implementing it on the larger pools um, for the decks, uh, but nothing that we can comment on at the moment. But again, nothing is impossible. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, moving along, there's a question from Selvam. What was the process used for changing the old ways of working, i.e. from paper, to the new way digital? How was resistance overcome? <laughs> we, we, Jock, um, I'll, I'll just quickly say, and then I'll, you can, I think you, you're the one who actually get to deal with it, but Peter, I've, I've seen it a lot um, uh, before as well, where it's difficult to implement new systems and you get pushback, but I must say what helped me getting this successfully implemented was a job driving this yeah, and, and taking the lead on, on the implementation, and, and I must say that helped a lot for me. Thanks, Jock. Okay, so, so it's a people process then? Yes, yeah. yeah. I would definitely concur. It is, um, we contemplated, especially on the first projects, whether we should run parallel processes. And, and Andre and myself had, had plenty of discussions about it. And, and the thing is, if you want to make a clean break, um, I've, I've seen that people can adjust very quickly. Um, you must um, gently nudge them along. So on, on sites where we implemented, we, we made a clean break. This is the new system, so therefore there is no alternative. It must be implemented and it must work for you. And it is a, it is a very short resistance period that I have seen on all sites. The moment people see the benefit, they buy into it, um, and, and I would definitely encourage it. But that's how we drove it, is to, to just not give an option um, where we've implemented, and, uh, and it has definitely shown huge results. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question, Tertia. Do you think this type of digitalization is being implemented as mainstream on construction sites in South Africa? If not, how could this be fast-tracked as it seems to be incredibly valuable for project management? I don't think it is um, as prevalent as I believe it could and should be um, I think it's a it's it's perhaps a difficult question. Um, I think it 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 needs a company to buy in, so you have to to drive that um, aspect uh, from top down. Um, I, I think if one needs to implement it, uh, clients can obviously assist. Uh, it, it depends, like um, our bigger clients, like a Sunrel or some others, if if it becomes a requirement. It will dictate the, the 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 pace at which it is implemented. But if we're going to leave it, um, it will take some time. I think the benefit in in uh, cutting some of the costs is is definitely there, and I think the market will ultimately drive us all towards it. Uh, but it might become a a slow and painful process for ind individual companies if we don't get on board uh, sooner rather than later. Well, thank you, Jacques. Uh, next question, Dudley. To what extent did the contractor contribute to the development of the system? And how does he rate the system in respect of furthering his progress? So the contractors didn't contribute um, at this point in time. The only thing is obviously they have to buy in, but uh, that's now, it's pretty much dictated by the consultants uh, still in terms of the process to engage uh, the consultants for inspection. So th there's easy buy-in as far as that is concerned. Ultimately, in terms of how contractors rate the system, is I, I've seen is entirely dependent on how, how much they take the system on board themselves. Um, some have given very positive feedback. Others are um, fairly... Um, um, neutral on, on the issue. I haven't had any negative uh, uh, feedback after the project, but, but it entirely depends on how the contractors ultimately drive it. I think there's also a bit of an opportunity to be able to, to sync it more to, to contractors' uh, requirements and ultimately their systems. Uh, I think there they might be some um, benefit in, in trying to, 
to uh, um, have some uh, synergy there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Shabedi. Where uh, were there any discrepancies between site inspection through BIM 360 reporting and payment certificates in relation to quantities? Um, if so, how did you resolve that? So yes, it, it did happen. So basically the inspection request comes on BIM 360 and when you do the inspection, you confirm that those uh, changes and measurements is accurate. And then when um, a claim comes through or the quantities come through, you will refer back to that inspection request and change the quantity based on that. So we've actually requested that the contractor adds the inspection request number to their um, volume claims or to their quantity claims that we can verify the quantity based on the inspection number. So there, there was discrepancies, but then we always fall back on the, on the inspection. Okay, thank you, Karine. Uh, next question from Shadrach. How does your use of ArcGIS site diaries override the normal book signed by the contractor as well or provision is made on the GIS tool? In other words, does the contractor also use some kind of signing by the GIS as well, or how does that work? As far as site diaries are concerned, uh, ours that which you have seen is, is purely supplementary to those. Uh, so uh, from the contractor side to be able to still have the fuller picture in terms of all plant on site, all activities that were uh, conducted, challenges on site that the contractor experienced, is, is, is there's still a need for that. Um, and that is ongoing. Um, but uh, this information, you really don't even need anyone to sign off. Uh, the, the platform itself captures everything to such an extent that there's very little um, question after the fact that it would be acceptable. But, it, but it, it, the intention is not to replace what we uh, know as the contractor's diary um, uh, on, a, on a site. It's, it's merely supplementary to that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I see our time is almost up. Um, Debbie, our timekeeper, is it okay to take, say, two more questions before we wrap up? We've had yes, a lot of Peter. questions. We're we only have about a halfway through. Yeah, How many should Peter, we take? Um, Peter, I think let's do like another two. And then what I suggest okay. is I can copy all the questions. And then maybe ACOM could answer the remaining questions and we could post them on our Facebook and um, LinkedIn, you know, profile for the division, if that's okay with you. Yes, I think that sounds okay. Is that okay with everyone else? Two more. Okay. Um, right. So one from uh, Dirk. How does the digital aspect used for this project impact on the finances in terms of traditional supervision? Well, one of those things that uh, we haven't really quantified yet and it would be interesting uh, exercise to do um, in terms of cost, implementation cost um, on a project. Uh, initially, there was a, a lot of investment in time. In terms of cost per project, it's, it's really not much. I mean, a couple of... Um, uh, iPads or tablets, and um, everyone's got a smartphone these days, so there's really very little that we invest on, on that side, uh, but it becomes very relevant to have the right people on site, so you need people that will drive this technology on site as well, um, so I think the, the little bit of investment that you have is quickly offset by the savings in terms of engagement with design, and time spent on, um, on just capturing uh, the day-to-day -day data on a, on a normal construction site. But, but Dirk, we haven't gone through that exercise to, to be able to reflect on, on real, real scenarios. Well, thank you very much. Um, last question from Philip. How long did it take for getting the contractor on board with the new systems? Well, that's pretty quick. It's, it's a five second chat. This is the only way and uh, off we go. No, so we, we do spend some time with all the contractors to, uh, to, to train them, to tell them exactly what is required um, uh, on the system. But because it, it frees them up as well, they can now log 
uh, requests literally from anywhere. It depends on how they manage it themselves, whether that task is is uh, delegated to more than one person or even one person sitting in the office. There's no need running up and down um, to write it in, in, in books. Uh, so on that, on that base alone, um, uh, basis alone, the contractors are pretty keen to, to get on board. Um, the, the system itself generates the necessary information and notifications through to the laboratories. Um, so that is not necessary anymore. So there's pretty quick buying on it. Uh, like I said, it's just ultimately getting value for it depends on the contractor. Okay, thank you for that, Jacques. Uh, all right, so that brings us then to a close in terms of our time. Um, just to let everyone know, we've had over 50 questions, so obviously a very hot topic. Um, so I would uh, I'd like to wrap up this afternoon's webinar, um, and I would like to give a, a huge um, vote to, of appreciation to uh, Karine, Jacques and Andre for the time and effort in compiling and producing their presentation. Uh, we well know that um, these things take a lot of effort and it's very much appreciated. And in addition to thank you for helping to spread uh, knowledge about how technology can be utilized in civil engineering. And it's very important we feel to spread, uh, spread the word. Um, and on that, we will be sending you each um, a gift as a token of our appreciation. And Debbie will be contacting you to arrange delivery of the gift. Thank you for everyone for attending this afternoon, uh, the IT division webinar, and we hope you find this uh, found this most interesting and we look forward to uh, seeing you all again soon on another presentation so thank you all for attending and also to the panelists thank you job well done thank you thanks peter thanks everyone thank you thanks very much karine andre <laughs> jacques yeah, pleasure, thanks guys goodbye Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Peter.